We've been talking about the, the uh, idea of what is the history of God. In other words, our human ideas about God and how they change throughout history. You see them changing in the Old Testament, people's ideas about God. We talked about, um, this is from last time, we talked about kind of, well, the history of God in the church. In other words, since Jesus, what, how has our understanding of God changed? And I suggested the first thing was, really God was conceived of in terms of the ideal of Greek philosophy, which Greeks had already been doing, Christians adopted it. And I would suggest that until now, that basically has gone unchanged. We still conceive of God primarily as God is a being, a supreme being, and these are his attributes. Now, if you'll note, God is not presented that way by Jesus. He never says, you know, my father is a supreme being having these attributes. Let, let's talk about him abstractly and theoretically. Jesus never does that. But we as in the church have tended to do that. And so people say, you know, who is God? And they'll start telling about God is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent. He is impassable. You know, and you say, what does impassable mean? Well, that's one of those formulations that he is unmoved by things. He's unmoved. He can't be, he cannot be changed. He is unchanging. He is the unmoved mover. He himself moves everything else, but he himself is not moved. And we talk about there's some problems with thinking about God in these ways. One is, if he's the unmoved mover, well, is he moved by compassion? Well, that's not the kind of move we meant. But it kind of is the kind of move we meant. If you say God is impassable, he cannot be moved, then is he really touched by our circumstances? Or is he, as the supreme being, perfect in himself, is he really kind of aloof? And I would suggest that for 2,000 years, we kind of had an idea of God that has in many ways made him aloof, untouched by our suffering. Because we wrestle with, why does he allow the world to be as it is if he's all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving? Why is the world in the mess it is? Well, he's also impassable, right? So I'm just saying there have always been problems. How, in fact, however we think about God, there will always be problems because we won't think about God perfectly, and so whatever idea we form is going to have some troubles that we're going to encounter as we try and think about, well, who is God? But there was that idea in the church, and it's really continued until now. I would say this is more through the history of the church. In the medieval period, the relationship with God was mediated through the church. If you're a Christian in the Middle Ages, you take the sacraments, you, you're born you know, a Catholic or, or Orthodox, you stay in the church, you take its sacraments, you're approved by its priest, and in the end, they'll perform for you last rites, and you are a Christian because you are part of that tradition. The big change that happens at the Reformation with Martin Luther is this whole idea of, you know what? It's not that you only relate to God through the, the historical traditions of the church. You actually have a kind of personal interaction with God. That's radical. Maybe we don't take it as radical because we're people who have come to Christianity post-Reformation, but it was radical for someone to suggest, apart from the church and its traditions and all of its you know, rituals and sacraments and all those things, as good as they might be, you yourself could come into the presence of God and you yourself, you know, language like, you can invite Jesus into your heart. And it's not simply through the auspices of the, the medieval church that you relate to God, it's because Jesus is your Lord, not a, and we don't, you know, that can stumble into individualism, right? He's just my personal Savior. It's just kind of all about me and Jesus, and, it, and that can be one of the pitfalls of a personal relationship is you become an individualized one, but it's still a big step forward. It's away from you relate to God through the church. Now there's a personal relationship and did you have a 
Quite well, sure. I'm, ju I'm just going to ask you on the explanation on the personal relationship. You know, it, it's called the Reformation, but wouldn't it really be restoration? Wasn't initially Jesus's? It's, it's a personal relationship, well, you know, then and that, and and then the church kind of, you know, you always have all these, you know, yes. first century, second century guys. They're not talking about the churches, you know, establishment. I mean, yeah. so so we're really returning to what Jesus had with the Reformation. Right. What happens what happens often is we look at fresh eyes with what Jesus was actually saying. Right? When Jesus says, Abba Father, there's a kind of intimacy there that if you were just, you know, living in France in the twelve hundreds, you didn't have that Abba Father relationship. You were a member of the church, the the priests performed the sacraments, they you know, they will do the last rites over you. You'll be well within the auspices of the church. And you, as long as you're born, you know, baptized and die within the church, you're okay. There wasn't. So, yeah, with the Reformation, people start reading Jesus with fresh eyes and saying, wait a minute. There's something deeply intimate and personal beyond simply the structures of the organization is how I relate. So, and, and I, I made the point last time that there's always been people who are exceptions. I would say all the mystics in this period, they had a personal relationship with Jesus and with God, which is why they were mystics and a little bit off kilter. You know, it's like those people are a little strange, but they seem to be Christian. But they had deeply resonant personal relationships with Jesus, even though the dominant thing was, you know, take the sacraments of the church and obey its rules and you'll be fine. They themselves were actually practicing something different. So we're talking kind of the general experience of most, not the only experience of any. There's always been people who've continued what Jesus had, which was this intimate relationship with his father, knowing his father as Abba, Papa, you know, close. The, 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 the phrase a, a toddler uses for daddy, you know, it's that intimate, close relationship. So... That hasn't always been like preached to the masses, right? But we, yeah, we go back and we read it and we say, wait a minute, this is what Jesus was talking about all along. I think that continues to happen, right? So that's a great observation. And this is my brief overview of church history, which is not worth a flip. Right? Honestly, it's not worth a flip. My history professors would be aghast at how briefly I'm doing it. <laughs> But I'm picking. You know, Darlene is a history professor. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ooh, well, you see all my mistakes. Okay, so the last one I'm going to bring up is what starts at Azusa Street, the Pentecostal movement, right? That's still a huge thing. Like, if you're looking at the broad movement of church history, here it was through an institution. Here it became something you, you are saved by grace through personal faith and that brings you into relationship with Jesus the church is still there but it's not the conduit only through which you can have a relationship with a distant God who's on the other side and all you have to deal with is church it becomes personal but here there's a I call it dynamic presence there's a new sense of at Azusa Street you know this breakout of a kind of Again, going back and saying, wait a minute, I think the Holy Spirit was a lot more active in Acts. Maybe we've kind of forgotten Pentecost. And so they were Pentecostals, right? Trying to revive a, not only a personal relationship, but a kind of personal involvement in something really powerful. Not about just the doctrines in your head, but this was, this was being lived out in very emotional as well as intellectual ways. And in the past, it's sometimes this beard, and I can make the mistake of veering too much into the intellectual. But the emotional was more embraced in the Pentecostal movement, right? Our emotions are not, you know, are not something to be suspicious of. In fact, the feelings that arise and the spirit might move us, and that's all a part of being caught up in God as well. So, I, again, there's a lot to say there, but I'm just saying briefly, you see that movement. I would suggest very briefly. But the question I want to play with a little bit today is if it has always been going on, and, and I'm, you know, if I've been a medieval Christian, I would have been a good person keeping the sacraments and being a 
part of the rituals and knowing I'm right because I'm with the, the church, right? I'm not saying I would have seen through any of that or his deficiencies. I probably would have been walking lockstep in it, right? So uh, just like if I'd been a Jew back in the time of Moses, I would have thought, yes, I think of God in the ways Moses talks about it. So this isn't about me or any of us being superior to other people in the past. We're not, we're not going to look down on people in the past. I think it's more about, but God has been moving his people. Can you see there's a kind of journey going on? He's moving his people from where he starts with the Jews saying, there's not a bunch of gods, there's really only one God, and I bring order. I'm a lawgiver. But then the prophets say, it's not only he just won over all the gods, there really aren't any other gods. He's, the, he's unique. He's not one among He's unique. There is no one else who really deserves the title of the living God. And it's more inward than just external law. And then I, I suggested, that was my turn, that Jesus brings us to the personal and human. He reveals God as personal and human. Might be a little shocking, but no one expected God to be human. But he showed up as a human. That changed everyone's paradigm, right? And then I've been outlining, well, here's what's going on since then. I think, and this isn't just me, if years ago Phyllis Tickle came, you remember, some of you remember when Phyllis Tickle came, she was, her, her, her job was in publishing, and her job was to be able to pick the books that would sell in religious areas. And so she had such a good sense of where things were, were heading that she could, she was very good at picking, this is where people are headed and these are the books that are going to sell. Well, she came and spoke to us and she had recently written her book about those every 500 years there tends to be what she called a rummage sale in the church, a major change. She pointed out the year 500 with Gregory the Great and kind of the move from the church of antiquity to medieval. The year 1000 roughly and the split between east and west. The year 1500 and the reformation. And she says, guess where we are 500 years after the Reformation. And you know what we call it philosophically? The move from modernity to post-modernity. We don't even know what to call it religiously yet because we're not sure what it's going to be. A mess. Well, but I think, but here's what I think. It's always the work of God, that God's Amen. working. Now, there's always excesses and there's, you know, three steps forward and two steps back. Nothing's perfect. But I'm really convinced is why I'm not a person of nostalgia saying, let's go back to that point in the past where we got it right, is because God's always in the future for us, luring us forward. We never had huh? It. Huh? We never had it right. No, we never had it. Well, this is, we're, we're always somewhat right and somewhat wrong, and God's moving us along. My sense is this 500-year change into postmodern, what that means, we're not sure yet. We don't even know what the name is. We're just saying it's the thing that comes after modernity. But what we're sure about is the modern age has played all of its cards and it's been found one. Right? For 500 years, we followed this modern art and it, it did some good things, but it also didn't solve all our problems. So philosophically, there's this move to post-modernity. I think something's happening religiously as well. And it's going to continue to happen for years and years, probably beyond my lifetime. It just doesn't happen instantly. It doesn't happen in three years. It's a big shift. But I'd like to ask the question for us to think about, what might the shift look like? Because there are theologians and people <laughs> who are talking about it. So... What, what does it look like after classical theism? I think one of the shifts that could happen is this, this idea of a supreme being modeled after the way the Greeks thought about God. Maybe after 2,000 years of unquestioningly thinking of God as a supreme being, maybe it's time to question our conclusions and say, but is that the best way to think about God as a supreme being. Once again, Jesus never says, let me tell you about the su supreme being my father is. Right? So we're not, we're, not, 
We're not ignoring Jesus to ask that question. We're not, we're not saying throw Jesus out. We're saying maybe let's go back and have a fresh look. How does Jesus talk about his father? He doesn't talk about him in abstract theoretical terms of his supreme nature and then all of his attributes. Jesus never does that. So what maybe would we learn? Um, and that, again, that doesn't mean that everything that's been thought about in terms of God is all incorrect. It's never an all or nothing, right? In other words, there's always been some things that were correct and then some things that needed correction. And so the idea would be, what do we keep from what we learn about thinking about God? Because I'm, I am convinced God is powerful and knowledgeable and present. But maybe how do I start to think about his power, knowledge, and presence, those omnis, in fresh ways? Not throwing them out, but saying, is there a different way to conceive of it? Okay. So some people would call this, I'm hoping I remember what's on my slides. <laughs> what does it look like to talk about the God beyond God? Where the second God is the supreme being really modeled after a Greek idea of the, per the perfect. Who is God if we move beyond that idea of God? Right? Again, it's not heretical to ask questions that question our conclusions because they're our conclusions. Right? It's how we thought about God. So I'm going to suggest probably in ways... Now here's where I really want to... Hmm. Okay. Well, that's not going to work, is it? Well, okay, I was going to bring these in one at a time, but I can't do that because what I found out is people online, it doesn't work for them. So, the first idea I want to question is that our idea of a supreme God gives us the idea of an inter interventionist God. Because we, we conceive primarily of God as a being with all these attributes, we start off with the idea the world, the universe is one thing and God is another. And of course, where does he? He's outside the universe. And his interactions with it are he intervenes or doesn't intervene. Right? That's how we tend to think. And our prayers are, God, please intervene. Like, we know that your general disposition is you just let things run according to the world's natural laws, but we're praying for you to intervene. Will you please step in and do something as opposed to what is happening most of the time when you're not doing anything, right? Now, we don't think, but that's really what we've thought in 2,000 years, <laughs> that 99% of the time, God's just letting things happen according to how they happen by natural law, the way the world is. And, but sometimes God might intervene and cure my cancer so that it doesn't run its inevitable course. And so we pray for intervention. I'm going to question the idea of whether God is an interventionist God. Not because he doesn't intervene. Maybe he was never outside to where intervening was necessary. <laughs> Because, see, the interventionist God starts with the idea he is outside and uninvolved and only occasionally becomes involved. Well, Richard Rohr calls it pride social. Right. What it, well, see, there's people talking about well, this God beyond God, right? They're talking about new ways of conceiving of God. Richard Rohr, I've also heard him say, what if maybe God is more of a verb than a noun? Think about that. This Greek idea of God, God is definitely a noun. He's a being, and he has these characteristics. What's, what's Richard Rohr hinting at when he says, well, what if he's more of a verb than a noun? Well, that's the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit does not sit still. Right. What if God, yeah, what if God is perpetually moving, rather than we think of him as a static entity, and then we... we, we identify all of his characteristics, and then we hope he intervenes, maybe sending the Spirit occasionally to do something. What if we start seeing God is ultimate dynamism? The motivating force behind him. Right. He's movement constantly. Well, motivating force, it's interesting, there is a 
philosopher theologian John Caputo, who says rather provocatively, and everyone's statements are provocative, we have to unpack them. <laughs> he says, God does not exist, God insists. He insists. What's he getting at? To talk about the existence of God is to postulate kind of his autonomous being, you know, as God. But when he talks about God as insistent, now he's saying God is this motivating, this compulsion, this drawing, this pushing, this compelling within you. Let's not talk about the God who exists. Let's talk about the God who insists, right? Now, these are people trying to wrestle with what if we get away from a kind of being supreme in nature, but somewhat removed, who then only occasionally intervenes what if the true nature of God, the one that Jesus was talking about, his father, was so embedded in the midst of everything that the idea of him intervening was nonsense? When was he ever not involved? The intervening assumes that you're not involved and then you become involved. What if God is so ubiquitously present? And what if we're elevating the omnipresence to, to an idea where he's so omnipresent that you can never have a moment where God is not, quote unquote, intervening. He intervenes constantly in everything. Okay, so let's look at some of the passages because we're going to go to scripture and maybe say, maybe they're hinting at a God who's like this. So the first one I give is the obvious one, 1 John 4, 8, God is love. We've often read that as God is loving. That John was saying, not who God is or what God is, but just an attribute of the God who is the supreme being. Oh, by the way, besides being omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, he is also loving. What if John really means is as the nature, the essential nature of his being? The verb. Yeah, it, he is this, and, and love is not static, right? Love. When does love ever sit and do nothing? It's not love at that point. Love is always flowing from the lover to the beloved, right? Love always goes from the one pouring it out to the, to the one they pour it out upon. And then love is always reciprocated. And so maybe Song of Solomon that we were told always is about Christ and his church is saying, Maybe John realized that God is the love flowing between the lover and the beloved. He's, he is that love, right? Which is always moving, which is always dynamic, which is more verb than noun. And that verb of love is powerful. In fact, all powerful. Its power exceeds the power of anything else. But its essential nature is we're not talking about a static bearded, white-haired man image, but we're talking about the flow of this energy that is God. Now, these are possibilities. That makes sense? I'm only talking about what if we were to think outside the kind of classical forms that we thought, just to maybe even get fresh perspectives on God. Well, and that our bodies are the temple. Yeah. Anyone who loves is born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. That's what John said. But maybe we've kind of said, but God, you know, God is loving. We've always heard it in a register of it's a characteristic of a supreme being rather than in the register of it's the essential nature of who God is. Or you could say what God, God is. What is God? He is love. And everything else that we've truly thought accurately about the nature of God is actually about the nature of love. It's all powerful. It's all present. It's all knowing that that's the nature of love. Okay, that's one verb. Um, a second one would be 1 Corinthians 15.25 where Paul talks about how when everything is wrapped up and all the enemies are made the footstool and it's all brought together in the big final conclusion that God will be all in all. Now how if God is all in all and that 
the realization of that will be consummated in the final end that God is bringing about. How does that God be an interventionist God? Right? This idea that he's kind of outside and occasionally dipping into the world to do something. If, if he is all and in all, again, how is, I can't even really conceive of him being an interventionist God because he's never not participating because he is all and in all. Now, Paul loves that phrase because he talks about Christ being all in all. This is not the only place where he uses it. He talks about it in terms of Christ being all in all. He talks about it here in terms of God the Father being all in all. So his understanding is there is nothing that God is not already all in. Right? And so then the, then the passage out of Acts 17, 28, where he's talking to the philosophers on Mars Hill, and he said, in him we live, move, and have our being. See, if we have our being, our essence in God as humans, and all my living and all my moving is in God, exactly when is God like outside and I'm praying for him to intervene? I am in God right now. We are all in God. The whole universe, he seems to be saying, is within God. That God is not an entity outside the universe. He is, in fact, the whole of the universe encapsulated. Remember, Jesus was an Eastern thinker, not a Western thinker. If you know the difference between Eastern and Western thought, broadly and generally, maybe we've read too much of Jesus like Westerners because you get over in the East and everything kind of gets very mystical, right? And maybe Jesus is actually saying things mystical, but we didn't hear them well because we're culturally Westerners, and so we made him fit our Western ideas. But, but maybe not only is Jesus talking that way, the apostles are talking that way, and they're saying things we just hadn't heard yet. Does that make any sense? And I'm just talking about possibility. What happens if we start thinking about God different? Alan? thoughts. Uh, one, C.S. Lewis, who I love, was really the whole basis of my coming to faith, or one of the biggest parts of my coming to faith, um, always says, well, if you, you know, if you can't understand it, put it aside and embrace you know, things. So I don't know that we will ever be able to, in human words, describe God accurately right. to the no, we cannot. <laughs> and he uses the example of you know, we are to God as uh, the ants in an anthill, and when you come over and kick the anthill, they have no clue that you know, it's this human being that you know was born is on the planet Earth, and because of kinetic force, you know, caused the anthill to, to disappear, and they have to rebuild it. So there's that thought, but in all in all, in love, where where I've kind of moved, and it's maybe it's because of my engineering kind of background, is God is life. And in life, we, A, we can't exist without it. It's everywhere. Even at night, we have moonlight, starlight, life. And if if you look at light as at, at the actual scientific engineering level, they now have discovered that like when the electrons move around in certain parts, there's no time. That there's actually the absence of time because of the, the forces and stuff in it. So the whole concept of something being outside of time used to always be like, ah, that's crazy. How could that be, yeah. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, I think we're moving to a point where we understand that God we are trying to understand that God is in everything and is in everybody that we oppose as well. And so you need to love them. You yeah. need to have mercy to tie into your sermon today that um, we're all, we're not all God, but we're all in God. We're all in God. And so that, he's, he's, <laughs> he's part of us. He's part of the whole person. He's part of the earth. He's the light. Yeah. I mean, He's everywhere all at once. So he's not an interventionist God. 
he sees and knows everything that's going on at every moment. Yeah. So, and we get to the, and so, yeah, I mean, those are good thoughts. The first one, I am not purporting to say, I can nail all this down. <laughs> I'm hoping that what I'm saying is, I'm giving us permission to think maybe outside of what the confines we've been given for the purpose of saying, how would that help me maybe think about God in fresh ways? Not discarding everything from the past, but giving it a new, uh, just a new twist. Dave? Okay? Yeah, I was thinking about the, um, what you talked about last week in Mark, where there's a storm and uh, Jesus is sleeping in the boat. And in a way, it's it, what we're talking about now can almost sort of be a parable, and my thoughts are a little mixed up in my head, but it's, it's like if God is all in all, then yeah. he is in, he's not separate. Yes. <laughs> perhaps the parable of that story is that our thinking is that God is separate, that he's over here doing yeah. nothing about what's going on here, yeah. when he's actually part of it. And to get to the point of seeing that, our understanding of God has to be shattered to the point where we go, who is this? You know, like, like the, the whole thinking about who Jesus was yep. changed. I like that. Yeah, I, I think that's that's very much in the same sort of mode of, of moving where we've got we've got to go. The last verse is this one from Ephesians, that there is one God and Father of all who is over all and through whom all and over all and through all and in all. I mean, how many ways can you say it, Paul? He's over, he's through, he's in. I mean, Paul's saying, well, yeah, how did you how do you then Later in the in the church's thinking, push God to a, a a long, white-haired, bearded guy on a throne up in heaven that we pray to intervene. You know what we're doing at that point? We're thinking more like God is like Zeus, yeah. hurling down thunderbolts from on high, and we're praying to Zeus to intervene. In other words, maybe we've not gotten that far from the Greek gods, but that's not who Jesus understood. That's not who Paul talked about. But naturally, it was how so many in the church continued to think about God as another version of the Greek gods. But maybe we make real progress in hearing Scripture in a fresh way when we go, okay, that's not what they're saying. He's more present, more participatory than we were thinking. He's not Zeus on high, occasionally casting down thunderbolts. He's in all, through all, we are in him, he is in us. And not just us, everything, everyone, the trees, the birds, it's all the presence of God to us. And all of it is alive with the presence of God. So I'll leave you with one last thought. Not because we're, well, obviously we'll never be done, right? You do realize we'll never be done. People 500 years from now could pick up this conversation and go, you know how far, this just illustrates how far they were from understanding God, <laughs> right? But for us, it's like, oh, this is the cutting edge of maybe new ideas. So, but people have been saying things like this. So, so two things that the way that Paul Tillich talked about it, he said, God does not exist. God is existence itself. Now he gets to the word, meaning of the word exist. What is the word? exit me to leave right the ex prefix has that meaning out and so for something to exist exist means to to have its being out of that's literally what exists and so we say i exist i'm saying i exist i am my being is out of well god cannot exist because then what did God come out of? And so, see, Paul Tillich isn't like throwing out theology. He's just being more precise, saying you can't talk about God existing. That would suggest he, there was something out of which God has come. But that's not what we believe. So he says God is existence itself out of which everything else exists. Does that make sense? And if he's saying this, Nine on a hundred years ago, but the church is still trying to catch up 
to what some of its prophets were saying, right? The other way he says it is, God is not a being, he is the ground of all being. He's beingness itself, right? I'm a being, I'm a human being. The tree is a tree being, but God is not a being, another thing. God is the essence of beingness out of which I have my existence and the tree exists, and he is the ground out of which we have all come and to which we will all return. And there's no, there's, you can't be out of God because your very existence has sprung from God, and he sustains you and everything, the mountains, the trees, and the universe, and the galaxy, right? So actually, see, all we're doing is we're trying to say maybe there's fresh ways to think about God that are not anti-biblical. They're not against what Jesus is saying. They're, they're kind of anti an antiquated Greek idea of a supreme being. But, may, but that was just a Greek idea that has maybe served us well for in some ways, but is insufficient. So it gives us permission to say, okay, God is the ground of our being. He is existence itself. You could say God is reality. Because right? anything we name as real, God is the reality undergirding that thing that's real. He's reality itself. Right? He's that present. That's how omnipresent he is. Right? So the summation of everything is in God. So some people would even say, some process theologians would say, the universe is the body of God. Well, they're basically saying, if, if you want to say God has a body, the body he has created for himself is the universe. There, it's the material reality of God's own selfhood. It's what he's made. It is of him. Or, or I heard this phrase recently. Uh, the world was not made by God. It was made of God. I like that little change, right? He did not make, he, the world was not made by him. It was made of him. In other words, it's godness turned into stuff. How does that start changing my way of reading Jesus about birds and lilies of the field and things like that and how he sees God in nature? If he's not seeing God in, a, in nature, which is separate, but he's actually seeing his father present in stuff that is of his father. Maybe he was more like that in his worldview that I've not tended to be. Or maybe it would help me if I was, right? Okay. Then, then what do you do with us being made in his image? <laughs> yeah. Um, everything's made in his image. Well, I mean, yeah. I just like, it, it, it's so much, it, it, it really changes what that question is. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we start thinking about what does it mean, mean to be made in the image of God? Maybe it's richer and more expansive and a greater mystery that, you know, I grew up with. Made in the image of God means we have the capacity to reason. It was limited to the capacity to reason. That's kind of a limiting, maybe it's more all-encompassing than simply my, my ability to log, think logically and reason about things is where I connect with God. That was the tradition I grew up in. Right? But that's maybe far too limited. Okay, we're going to stop here. Uh, but we'll, we'll pick up some other thoughts, ideas, Next week, ideas beyond just simply maybe God's not an interventionist. So, thank you all. all right,